Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Barker. That is just a lovely introduction. Um, now I feel like I'm going to under-deliver. <laughs> It has been a true pleasure to, to be here, to spend the day with you. I've enjoyed meeting some of you in your classes and over lunch and, and just having just a rich dialogue and, and hearing about the things that you're grappling with. And, and you know, every, every session went longer than it was supposed to. We could have stayed all afternoon, and, and I think we all wanted to. And, and so I just thank you for, for welcoming me here. Um, so I'm going to talk about purpose, promise, and the struggle. Um, some of you have heard some of my struggles today. Um, every person in this room probably has one thing in common. And that's we've all had at least one dream crushed. In middle school, I was one of those strange kids who knew exactly what I wanted to do when I grew up. I wanted to study psychology, not because I wanted to be a counselor, but because I wanted to understand how people think, what they believe, why they believe, and in short, I wanted to know how the mind works in society. But what I didn't know in middle school was how easily you can become derailed from your dreams. Earning A's in high school came easy for me, and I took every chance I could to learn about psychology. Every paper I wrote, I'd pick a topic on psychology. Every book I read was on a psychological topic or a mental topic or on mind control or cults or interpretation of dreams or all these things that, that are all about psychology. There were no courses in my high school on psychology. So I sought it out, and I drank it in. When it came to psychology, I loved it, and I was good at it. But none of that prepared me for my first semester in college. I was thrilled to take my very first psychology course. I enrolled. I loved it. I studied. I struggled. I eked out a C minus. I think my professor was being kind. Yes, a C minus in the course that marked the entry into my dream. Now, if that wasn't good enough or that wasn't bad enough, I earned a C in African American studies. Now my ethnic identity was called into question. So I did what any self-respecting freshman student in their first semester would do. I called my mother. <laughs> With my dreams crumbling in my hands and my ethnic identity in question, she said exactly what I feared. Well, and I can still hear her voice. Well, maybe you aren't cut out for college. piercing light now exposed my deepest inner fears. You know, isn't it just like mom to both know your fears and then display them and report them back to you? <laughs> there I was. So are any of you privately afraid that you're not cut out for your dreams? Or are you afraid you might not figure out what your dreams are supposed to be in the first place? What well, turns out our fears are not unfounded. We're not alone in wondering whether we'll find careers that are meaningful and fulfilling. This is especially true in the wake of the Great Recession. Only 30% of recent college graduates are in jobs they consider part of their career. 37% are underemployed, meaning they're in jobs that don't utilize the skills and talents that they have. Students often flounder and find themselves in crisis 
as they make the transition from college to work, moving from one job to the next, with both employers and employees dissatisfied with the experience. In fact, young adults who change their aspirations frequently or find that they're unable to clearly articulate their aspirations often have greater distress about their career. They often earn lower wages on average and are more likely to quit school. For those who stay in school, there, there's tremendous pressure. There's often a gap between reality and our dreams. Now, the evidence is clear that the surest path to success is a college degree. But a large percentage of recent college students are so mired in student loan debt that it calls into question whether college was a good investment. Ironically, rather than better preparing students, the more one spends on college, the more the stakes go up. The more people expect of you, the more pressure is placed to find a fulfilling job that's fulfilling both emotionally and financially. It's hard not to be pessimistic. It's hard not to be cynical. But it's in this context that our research focuses on teens' dreams for their future. How do they imagine their lives? What do they hope for? What will it take to reach their goals? And this is how my earliest interest in how people think and what they believe reemerges in my research today. In our most recent research, we've been following about 1,100 students through high school as they make their transition to post-secondary experiences, including college, work, vocational school, the military. And we've been looking at how adolescents view the economy they're entering, the goals they have for their future, their interests and their efforts in school, the kinds of relationships and experiences that are associated with positive adjustment post high school. What if you could unplug from all of the pressure and find true joy and contentment in your career and in your college courses? What if? I have three potential solutions for you. One, you can move back home with your parents and agree to do the dishes. You can check out of the whole career fulfillment thing, hide out in your parents' basement, and wait out for better days. Just don't tell them I sent you. Second, you can opt for one of those jobs that they call a sure bet. You know them. People call them recession-proof. They're always there, and for some of them, you can make a decent salary. But are those the jobs you want? Third, you can figure out what you were meant to do and do it with a passion. There's a difference between having career aspirations or educational goals and having a sense of purpose. And it's purpose that ultimately is most important. As a developmental psychologist in a school of education, I've been interested in this intersection between kind of inner goals and beliefs and purpose with knowledge and preparation and planning and training that happens in the school context. I've been interested not just in academic achievement, but in education in its broadest sense. I've been interested in parenting and parenting goals, not just in that relationship between how parents you know, help kids grow up and, and relate to school and family school relationships, but how parents achieve their own parenting goals through their relationships with schools and what happens with schools and their children. So early on in my, in my research, I focused on, on students' goals and aspirations, what they wanted to be when they grew up. I wanted job titles and I would code them. I looked at educational goals and I was interested in, in helping kids want to go to college and helping them get in. And I looked at how all of that varied across socioeconomic status, ethnicity, region of the country, characteristics of neighborhoods. And I became interested in this gap 
between what people aspire to become and what they're willing to settle for. And then what bridges that gap? And then how do people interpret that gap between their dream and where they sit? But these aspirations and expectations, occupational goals and, and educational goals, they just felt tinny in my mouth. They were largely based on students' goals, job titles, career aspirations, and the skills and theories didn't really get at the heart and soul of what I was really interested in, which is ultimately what is God's purpose and how do people find it? And how do people find fulfillment? And so with my colleague, Dr. Bell Liang at Boston College, we began to look at students' sense of purpose in our study of 1,100 youth that we've been following for, for four years now. And I had, I had done a lot with purpose in my spiritual life. Miles Monroe wrote an incredibly impactful book on finding your purpose back in, in, in the mid-90s. And of course, Rick Warren has made purpose, you know, household word, right? But how could we understand this through a lens of psychology and understand this using theories of psychology and development? So in psychology, a sense of purpose is defined by Bill Damon, a, a leading psychologist, as the intention to accomplish something that is both meaningful to the self and of consequence to the society at large. So it's both future-oriented and about the as individual person's role but it's also about the common good of society. <clears throat> and so we began studying this in our high schoolers. And our central hypothesis was that students aspire to go to college. And when they aspire to go to college, and getting into college is their goal, rather than having a purpose, a sense of purpose or a goal that just so happens to require college, that those students are at risk for disengagement and dropping out when things get tough. However, when students have identified and cultivated their sense of purpose, then the vagaries and challenges that become college life, or just life, serve to sharpen your pursuit of your purpose rather than derail it. And that was one of the central questions of our work. You know, as a society, we spend an enormous amount of effort and energy on college access, helping youth, especially low-income youth, aspire to go to college. In reality, 85% of mil middle schoolers want a four-year college degree, 85%. And that's been true since the 80s. But only 36% of Americans between the age of 25 and 44 hold a four-year college degree. What happens between eighth grade and adulthood? We've forgotten how to help high schoolers and college students cultivate why they go to college in the first place. So when my mom said, maybe you're not cut out for college, I had to come up with an answer. And I had to decide. One, her statement is true. I'm not cut out for college. And now that the truth is out there, I have a face-saving way of dropping out. Even my mother knew. <coughs> or she's wrong, dead wrong. Have you ever had that kind of argument with your mom? <laughs> dead wrong, you're wrong. and I'm going to prove it, right? So I needed evidence that was stronger than the evidence that was before me. My mother's proclamation, my C and C minus, my academic scholarship that's now teetering. I needed evidence. And that evidence is grounded in our sense of purpose. But how do you find this purpose that you're talking about? There are numerous life coaches and bartenders <laughs> who'll be really happy to talk to you about your purpose. They'll listen really, really well. But there is a more important and sustaining way to identify why you're here 
And what's your purpose? In our research, we focus on the most important people in students' lives, their parents and their relationships with schools. And we find that supportive relationships, both at home and at school, is associated with a stronger sense of purpose and reduced anxiety about the job market. But why? When we think about careers, we often think about vocation. And the word vocation is very similar in its origin to sense of purpose. It comes from the Latin word vocare, which means to call, or vocatio, which means to summon, and both of which come from the word vox, which means voice. So vocation, it's a calling. It's a mission. It's a life's work. It's very much like purpose. So here's the burning question. Is it possible to have a calling without a caller? Right? Who does the calling? In our research on parents, we focus on parents because parents know kids best. We focus on schools because people in the schools, teachers, counselors, friends, they help kids navigate the world and navigate their talents and their opportunities and hone their skills. But honestly, I think it's bigger than that. I suggest to you that there just might be a caller who designed you with gifts, talents, and a purpose. We aren't supposed to find our vocation all by ourselves. We're called to it. So then the question is, what are you being called to do? Imagine what might happen if you listened for a voice calling you into your vocation. Might the best voice be the one who designed you, the one who created you? When I first became a Christian, I thought it was about going to church, because you're supposed to go to church. I thought it was about being, trying hard to do what was right, about asking forgiveness when I did something wrong, and most importantly, to go to heaven after I died. I wanted to settle the afterlife, be a good person, and then get on with my life. But what I didn't understand was that God was interested in making my everyday life meaningful and purposeful. The Bible claims that you know, we're made in God's image, and so he made us, and he created us, and he has expectations for us. And that means that, that there are good gifts and talents within us that we're to use to make the world a better place. And that's how we give back to God. That's how we worship God. I think of it this way. When we create something, us, we have expectations for it. Think about something you might have made in a maker space. I like to cook. So here's this recipe that I've made, and I have expectations for it. Putting together something for a kit. When it does what it's supposed to do, tastes the way it's supposed to taste, makes my people around the table delight. When it does what it's supposed to do, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled. Thrilled. When it doesn't, what do we do? We tinker with it. We poke at it. We re-season it. We add salt. We add whatever we add to get rid of the fact that we added too much salt in the first place, <laughs> right? We break stuff off of it. We add stuff to it. We go on Amazon and get the thing that they said we should have bought in the first place, right? We try to fix it. Why? Because we had expectations for it. It had a purpose. 
And I like to think being made in God's image, God kind of works in the same way. So when we're doing what we're designed to do, God's thrilled. He's thrilled. And when we aren't, he wants to help us. Dare I say, tinker with us, right? And sometimes that tinkering and that preparing feels like obstacles and barriers and struggles. But they're designed to sharpen us. But we have to know what our purpose is. And being a Christian means in part that we're that God wants to help us do things that he's designed us to do and to help him make the world into the place he designed it to be. And it turns out doing the things that we're designed to do, what our purpose is, doesn't mean it's easy street. It's hard work. But it's ultimately more satisfying work. In positive psychology, we talk about flow. We talk about being in the zone. We talk about being on fire. But it's really about, secrets out, finding God's purpose. Finding his purpose for our lives and understanding what our gifts are. And when we're operating in our purpose and operating and using our gifts and our talents, we flow. Obstacles can't stop us. We chew them up. We eat them for lunch. Show me an obstacle. I'm going to show you how good I am. <laughs> right? And God can help us find those areas. In the Bible, God reminds his people of purpose. But it's not when you think. He reminds us of, of our purpose. Not when things are going well, but when things aren't going well. When things are challenging. When people are struggling. It's in that moment of adversity and feeling down that God promises vocation. He promises a calling. He promises purpose. He calls us when we're down. The prophet Jeremiah was sent to the Israelites to remind them of their purpose. He was sent to the Israelites when they had been in captivity for 70 years. There was no sign that they were going back home. And this meant two generations of youth grew up in a place where they didn't belong, hoping to go home, and it wasn't going to happen. Times were tough. They struggled. They probably forgot what the good life was supposed to be. Some were holding out, not settling down, not pursuing their purpose. They were waiting to go back to Israel. They were waiting for the perfect time and the perfect place. Don't we sometimes wait for that? But it was then that God reminded them of their purpose, his plans for them, his promise to give them a purpose, to give them hope in a future. He reminded them to settle in that foreign land, to pray for its prosperity, and to find their purpose in that place, the place they didn't call home, the place they wanted desperately to leave. He has a plan for you, a purpose for you, God wasn't just saying this randomly. He was saying it to his people when they were feeling terribly oppressed. They were having a worse time of it than I was having when I came home with my C minus, to be sure. And it's in that context that God reminded them of their purpose, to encourage them despite the obstacles that they were seeing, despite being in captivity, despite feeling marginalized, despite feeling misunderstood, despite having doors closed in their face, God wanted them to know that he had a plan, and it was a good one. When we struggle, God reminds us of our purpose. Similarly, in the New Testament, the disciples were expecting Jesus would come and save them from the Romans and set up a new kingdom, and the Jews would be in charge. When Jesus was killed, their whole sense of purpose, everything they were living for was turned completely upside down. But Jesus prepared them, reminded them of their purpose, reminded them of his teachings before he left, equipped them with the Holy Spirit 
so they could fulfill their purpose in his absence in the context of great oppression. Finding out who we are and our purpose in God as the one we made us is one of our central roles of being a Christian, is finding out who we are. And helping those around us identify their talents and their purpose is also a chief part of being a Christian. Christ died so that we could be reconciled back to our true identity, to our true purpose, to who we are, the talents that we haven't uncovered. It's not for us to be whisked away from this world. It's so that we can find our place in it and make it better. You know, counterintuitively, and the research is always something counterintuitively, counterintuitively, when the economy's bad and finding a job is hard, youth tend to aspire for careers with deep meaning. Not the ones that pay the big paycheck. That's why it's counterintuitive. You think jobs, if the economy's bad, I want a job that pays well. Nah. When jobs are tough and the economy's bad, and jobs feel scarce, youth tend to aspire for, to jobs where money, you know, low, I want to be able to eat, but I don't need to make a lot of money. I want to do something good. They aspire for jobs that have meaning, not the big paycheck. And it turns out the big paycheck is fleeting anyway. It's also unsatisfying. If that's the thing you're pursuing, it's unsatisfying. You can go the safe route, the sure path, and you may be safe for a season, but you might not be satisfied. When times get tough, you might not have the foundation to ward off your own insecurities. When the well-trod path isn't paying off, it's a good time to, to step back and revisit. What's your purpose? What are your talents? What's God calling you to? What's the struggle about? Is the struggle a righteous one? Is the struggle telling me that I should be stopping and listening? It's time to listen to the one who created you, who knows your purpose, knows your talents, even better than your mother. You can find your purpose and your talents with who you are with God, through God. And in reality, being a Christian isn't about going to church. And it isn't just about following the rules, and it isn't just asking for forgiveness of sins. It isn't just about the afterlife in heaven. Oh, that's a pretty good deal. It's about knowing who you were meant to be from the one who created you. It turns out that my mom was a better psychologist than I imagined. She knew my purpose and she knew my calling in psychology and she knew it because she raised me and she could see it on me. She hoped and I dare say knew that her challenge to me that I wasn't cut out for college, she, she kind of knew that might not derail me, but it would cause me to dig deep inside myself and in my relationship with God and find my true calling and my true purpose. And then not just persist through the obstacles and the C and C minus, I can tell you, it's just the first of all of them, <laughs> but to transcend those obstacles into a place of purpose. Thank you. <laughs>